Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the staff of Equitable Growth for inviting me to this to participate in this important conversation. The arrival of 20 Africans in Jamestown in 1619 marked the beginning of 400 years of unrelenting, unequal, and oppressive treatment for their descendants. One of the leading civil rights voices challenging that treatment was Sadie Alexander, and she did so by using arguments tied to economic justice. Now, it's likely that you have not heard of Sadie Alexander since she has been lost in historical memory. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about her and why I believe that her public policy vision from the World War II era is as relevant today as it was 75 years ago when she began discussing the need for full employment policies. Sadie Tanner Mussel was born at the turn of the 20th century in 1898 into a prominent and highly accomplished African-American family in Philadelphia. She attended the University of Pennsylvania and experienced racism from classmates and racial exclusion on campus. In June of 1921, Sadie Mosell became the first African American in the United States to earn a doctorate degree in economics. But there were no colleges or universities who were willing to hire a black woman economist into their faculty. In 1923, she married Raymond Alexander and a year later entered law school again at the University of Pennsylvania. But it was her experiences with racial discrimination that motivated her to go to law school and become an attorney. In fact, Sadie Alexander devoted her life to fighting for equal rights and protections for African Americans, and she therefore had an impressive an important career as a civil rights lawyer and activist before she died in 1989. I started researching Sadie Alexander's extensive archival records at the University of Pennsylvania about 15 years ago because I was determined to see if she had something of interest to say about economics beyond her dissertation, and if so, to excavate her economic thinking in order to restore Sadie Alexander to her rightful place in the canon of economic thought. I found that even though Sadie Alexander became a lawyer rather than a working economist, she spoke, spoke presciently on economic issues that are of great concern today, including the need to combat black poverty and marginalization through full employment policies, the scapegoating of migrant communities, the important role women play within the economy, and the necessity of minimizing income inequality. So today I'm going to focus on Sadie Alexander's arguments for full employment policies during World War II. Indeed, I believe that she may have been the first American economist to advocate for a federal jobs guarantee. During World War II, the government achieved full employment by using direct job creation through public works programs, such as the Civilian Conservation Corps and Works Progress Administration. But given the expected 40% cutback in jobs after the war ended, Sadie Alexander advocated that government continue to provide full employment through public works in the post-war period. As the U.S. neared the end of World War II, in January 1944, in his State of the Union address, President Roosevelt called for a second Bill of Rights to provide, quote, a new basis of security and prosperity. He believed that the transformation of the economy into an industrial economy since its founding required an expansion of citizens' rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Indeed, he stated that it was, quote, self-evident that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. He also stated, quote, people who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. Sadie Alexander shared with Roosevelt the concern over economic insecurity and the danger that it posed to democratic rule in the U.S. 
Alexander gave a speech in early 1945 at Florida A&M College that gave a more in-depth analysis of the racial implications of economic insecurity than Roosevelt's speech. Alexander was concerned with the effect that economic insecurity had on people's lives, on their quality of life, but also in giving rise to racial hostility. Alexander warned that economic insecurity would increase racial ethnic violence and that it would undermine the rule of law. In her speech, she drew on lessons from the previous World War. Economic uncertainty due to the loss of jobs following World War I, and especially the perception of black social mobility, fueled white anger and led to over 30 incidents in 1919 where white mobs terrorized black men, women, and children across the country, killing hundreds of black people and destroying black homes, businesses, and communities. We are, of course, in the midst of the 100th anniversary of that awful period known as Red Summer. Indeed, Sadie Alexander believed that economic security was vital not only to enhance human well-being, but also as a foundation for the maintenance of democratic institutions. She warned that fears of economic uncertainty and hopelessness can be manipulated and channeled into scapegoating against marginalized communities. In a 1939 talk, Sadie Alexander said that, quote, dissatisfaction and discontent with the economic condition of the country has given rise to race baiting speeches, end of quote. And like Roosevelt, Sadie Alexander feared that economic insecurity would result in, quote, men and women who have lost hope demanding a dictator to take over the reins of government, end of quote. We have, of course, seen this process unfold recently with the rise of right-wing populism in Europe and in the US with the election of Donald Trump and his ongoing racial demagoguery and disregard for democratic norms and practices. In the 1945 Florida speech, Sadie Alexander spoke to the audience about the persistence of racial discrimination and the status of black workers as marginal workers, workers who were the last to be hired and the first to be fired when businesses were letting workers go. In addition, she believed that all workers would benefit from full employment and wanted white workers to realize the benefits from full employment instead of perceiving black workers as rivals and threats to jobs. She believed that all workers would benefit from full employment because it would mean having job security. The threat of unemployment erodes workers' abilities to negotiate with employers over better compensation and working conditions, either as individuals or as members of unions who engage in collective bargaining. Alexander believed that having a fully employed labor force would increase workers' pay and purchasing power. This could not occur if whites continued to exclude black workers from having the right to work. Sadie Alexander said that full employment was, quote, the only solution to the economic subjugation of the Negro and of the great masses of white labor. If full employment by determination of the people and the government could be obtained for the destructive purposes of the war, why can we not achieve it for the constructive purposes of maintaining the peace? Therefore, Alexander favored government taking an active role in the economy when there were shortfalls in production. She believed that the federal government should provide jobs that paid livable wages to workers who were willing and able to work, but who were unable to do so because of the failure of the private sector to generate enough jobs. Alexander maintained that the right to work was a fundamental right that all citizens, indeed all humans, should have. And the example of the success of direct job creation during World War II was the lesson that FDR and Sadie Alexander drew upon when they called for a fully employed labor force in the post-war period. 
Moreover, when Sadie Alexander talked about full employment through public works programs, she focused on public works projects that addressed urgent national problems. However, the problems that she suggested were about quality of life issues. In other words, Sadie Alexander focused on investments in people, not just investments in physical infrastructure of building and repairing roads and bridges, but also investments in what we would call social infrastructure, health, education, nutrition, for example. Alexander envisioned a public works program that addressed pressing needs that would enhance people's well-being. She called for improving housing conditions in urban slums, providing electricity to every farm, reducing illiteracy, reducing hunger, and making sure that people were properly clothed. That's typically not what we think about today when we focus on public works, and yet Sadie Alexander's vision is a more comprehensive public works or jobs program because it would create jobs in a variety of fields and also have the effect of improving the quality of people's lives in both the short and long term. I want to conclude by linking Sadie Alexander's economic analysis from the 1940s to our current political economy and its continued transformation. Since the election of Donald Trump, there has been increased national attention focused on the economic problems of rural working class whites and others who face financial uncertainty in Rust Belt factory towns. Their concerns, in fact, span over 40 years and are due to changes in the economy with the decline in manufacturing and the growth in lower paid non-union service jobs. I also want to note that these same problems that are linked to economic dislocation and precarity have long played communities of color in the US, although the national conversation has been less attuned and less sympathetic to their plight. Black workers in particular continue to suffer from unemployment rates twice as high as white rates. Three quarters of a century ago, Sadie Alexander promoted full employment as the solution to the overall problem of economic insecurity and as the means for countering persistent racial discrimination in labor markets. She envisioned that full employment policies would ameliorate many of the economic problems that continue to plague workers in the US. Income inequality, marginal work, inadequate wages, and the racial anxieties and disparities these problems exacerbate. The idea that the federal government should guarantee jobs paying livable wages is a vision that recognizes the corrosive nature of economic insecurity in our communities and the benefits instead of shared prosperity that expands citizens' rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will resume shortly. Lunch is available in the salon.